today. I get to talk to somebody who has been on my list wanting to get her on the podcast. She is just the most effervescent, lovely, amazing Aww. person, plus a phenomenal <laughs> songstress. Her name is Natalie Grant. Natalie, thanks so much for being on with me. You are me. kind. Thank you for that intro. Wow. <laughs> hey, you That's know so what? <laughs> Anybody who can show up in this time frame and all the crazy stuff we all have going on, uh, I, I just really appreciate you. Oh, my word. Well, I'm honored to be with you. <laughs> so I'm sure most of my listeners are wildly familiar with you, but just give us a snapshot of your life and your loves and uh, where you live, all that. Absolutely. Well, I make my home in Nashville, Tennessee. I've lived here for well over 20 years, but I was born and raised in Seattle. If anybody follows me on social media, they will know that I am a diehard Seattle girl. I feel like I bleed rain. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a Pacific Northwest girl at heart. Um, but I've been married for 20 years uh, to my love, Bernie Herms, who's an unbelievable songwriter and music producer. And my three daughters, I've got twin daughters, Gracie and Bella, that are 13. They are <laughs> and 13. another daughter, oh. Sadie, that is nine years old. And um, it keeps life interesting, especially in this season <laughs> uh, yeah. of all of a sudden becoming an overnight homeschool mom. Mm -hmm. So anyone that is watching or listening, if you are a homeschooler, I always respected you, but I have a whole newfound respect for you at this moment. <laughs> it's a whole new thing now. My twins are also yeah. about to turn 13. And uh, it's, it oh. is a whole different thing with two of them at the same time, yeah. walking through all the tween Jesus. stuff and the different hormones. Thing. You got yeah. girls or boys? Yeah. It's a boy and a girl. girl. So they're fraternal. Boy girl. Your girls are fraternal, yeah, right? Very fraternal. Yeah, yeah, mine too. Mine too. Mine too. So, yeah, I I had forgotten that the girls were the same age as mine. I'm gonna, yeah, we're gonna need to stay in touch for mental health purposes for sure as we as we navigate Absolutely. this as we navigate this. Oh, so, Nellie, okay. I've been thinking a lot about you because you know you said you're originally from Seattle and then you're in the Nashville area now. And girl, yeah. both of your hometowns have been hit like crazy over the last few yeah. weeks. You know, Seattle's yeah. kind of a few weeks ahead of the rest of the country in dealing yes. with all the COVID-19 stuff. But in Nashville, y'all had just experienced a tornado. Oh, I so, mean, we had just experienced yeah. a ravaging tornado. Right. And it's hard to even wrap your head around the fact that all of those people that were homeless and don't have a roof and don't... Now all of the volunteers had to stop, you know, all of the work that was happening had to stop. So yeah, Nashville's kind of going through it at the moment, but also to know that Seattle is kind of the ground zero, if you will, right, right of this in America, because it was the first case. My brother is a doctor in Seattle. My niece is a doctor in Seattle. So to hear from them, it actually was one of the things, to be honest with you, Julie, that helped me begin to take this very seriously. Like, mm. you know, a few weeks ago when it wasn't really affecting your community as much, you would hear about things on the news, but being transparent and honest, it was kind of hard to really have the severity of it um, set in because right, it wasn't right. really affecting us in middle, middle Tennessee quite as much. Um, and, but talking to my brother and my niece, it was like, my niece had to start using the same mask every day, like weeks ago. And you're just like, this sounds like a third world country. Like it was hard to even digest what she was telling me, but it helped me start telling everybody I know, guys, this is real. It's real. Yeah. <laughs> this is yeah. real. This is serious. Protect your families. What they're, what the leaders are telling us to do, heed it, stay home, respect authority. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, it does feel like something out of a dystopian novel in some ways. It, really it, does. It, it seems so odd. And you're right, there's a psychology involved that, you know, if you don't know someone who's had it, or you don't right. necessarily, you're not necessarily connected to someone in the medical community, or it can feel like, oh, it's over there. And yet, that's exactly what I think are the ideal conditions for a virus of this sort is for everybody to sort of 100%. assume it's out there and not here. So how yeah. have you and your husband been talking through with your girls? Because of course, for yeah. a lot of our kids, this has been a really intense lifestyle change. And your girls had just been through watching a tornado go through their hometown. So right. how are you guys managing this as parents? Their stress, the change in their schedules, all yeah. the things. <laughs> you know, I'd like to say that we're handling it perfectly. Um, it's kind of a day to day situation. For a while, I think we were trying to protect them a little bit from some of the sadness because there's, I think one of the things that really shifted my thinking 
was instead of thinking about how inconvenienced I was, I mean, to be honest, I'm unemployed. My husband is unemployed, right? I mean, we both, we don't, we're not salaried. We're, right. we're musicians and overnight we're unemployed. My band, unemployed. My crew, unemployed. Um, so these things have math. So instead of viewing it as just being inconvenienced for a while, I think when you begin to read the stories of people who have lost loved ones, one of the stories that really knocked me um, down was a story actually out of the Seattle area. It was a woman from Everett. I don't know if you read that story, but um, she's a single mom of six kids. And she had recently lost the father of all those kids. And then she had just beat breast cancer. And then she just died of COVID-19 and those six kids are orphaned, you know, and when I literally cry talking about it, um, when you read that, you go, this is not um, something that's just an inconvenience for us. Those kids had to tell their mom goodbye on the phone, right? They couldn't over a walkie talkie, right, they couldn't yeah. even see her. And that was when I thought, you know what, um, carefully, we need to tell our kids the truth. Right. We actually need to tell them the truth because part of the biggest stress uh, in our house has been my kids hearing from some of their friends on texting that they were still hanging out and acting like it was summer vacation. And, you know, for me as a mom, number one, I had a problem with that. My, I'm going to get out my soapbox. For do it. Do it, girl. Preach. I had a, I had a problem with that because... What are we telling our kids if we can't even respect authority? So if we can't respect what our leaders are telling us to do, how do we expect our kids to respect us? So if we can't respect authority, if we can't model that for our kids, then don't be surprised when your kids can't honor authority, right? So that was my big thing was like, parents, what are you doing? This isn't summer vacation. This is stay home stay inside, go outside for a walk in a protected environment, go outside in your backyard and play. This is not get together with your friends and hang out time. Right. And, um, so for me, my kids were mad. They yeah, were mad yeah. at me. They were mad at my husband. They were like, why are you doing this to us? Because they didn't understand. And that's when it was like, it's time to tell our kids the truth. Actually, it's time to explain to them. What if this was your grandparents that you never got to see again and you never got to tell them goodbye? What if this was my daughter, Gracie, who has compromised lungs because she has asthma? What if this was you, Gracie? You've been through an asthma attack where you almost died. You were in the ICU for seven days. You barely pulled through. And you remember what it's like to not be able to breathe. These are people that can't breathe. And I think explaining that to them carefully so as not to paint this doomsday like it's the end of the world. But our kids need to know the truth. They do. Right? They yeah. need to be told the truth. They need to be um, given the word of God at the same time. So for us, we're like doing a verse a week. Like let's memorize one verse a week. Let's not try to drown our kids in the Bible. <laughs> right, right. But, but you're, yeah, but just get it in that, there. Yeah. That's easy that they can hold on to. This week it's cast all your anxiety on him because he cares, he cares for, for you. you. That's mm -hmm. one of the easiest verses to memorize. And we looked up what the word cast means. It means to throw as far away from you as you can, that it doesn't need to be anywhere near you. And I think kind of partnering, like tell your kids the truth and then arm them with the word of God that they can put into their heart and carry with them. Um, that's kind of how we're doing it. And some days we yell at each other and cry. <laughs> other <laughs> days we champion each other and go, we're going to make it. Um, and that's just kind of how it's like our day-to-day -day existence at the moment. <laughs> yeah. And Natalie, do you find, I mean, I feel like I find at my house that when I treat more in a sense, I'm not saying moms and dads have to befriend their kids. We know that we're supposed right. to be the ones guiding and, and mentoring and leading. But when I entrust them with something, even if I feel like, oh, I still want them to be babies and I don't want to yes. burden them with this, they rise to it. That's what I find. Absolutely. Have you found it to be the case at your house? 
we find it totally to be the case. So we're not big news watchers in our house, um, mostly because I hate commercials and I don't like my kids watching commercials. That's really, I've got three girls that are so influenced by what they see. So that's just kind of a choice we've made. Streaming is it for us because there's no commercials. Right, right. <laughs> uh, you can control it a little bit more. So we're not big news watchers. I get my news on my apps, you know, and online. So I think number one, if you're a parent, I would say to you, be really careful what you're playing throughout your house mm -hmm. because our kids don't miss a thing. They hear everything. If they hear you talking about being afraid and panicked, they're going to internalize that. So again, it's about being real. But when you tell your kids what's happening, you control the narrative. Right. So you get to control how it's sensationalized or not. And when you're giving them facts, you're empowering them with the truth. You're inviting them in to what you know. I notice, especially in my twins at their age, they it makes them feel really good when I trust them right. with something important. So I feel like controlling the narrative is important, but watching them kind of grab a hold of this is also important. Um, you know, this is our kids thing. This mm -hmm. is going to be what their kids and their kids' kids read about in history books. And this is going to be their, I walked to school five miles in the snow with no boots. And right, this right. Is their this is it. Mm -hmm. thing they're going to be telling. And I feel like controlling the narrative with them is going to be important. Um, but telling them the truth is really, really important. Yeah, I keep I keep repeating this phrase to myself and, and to friends just saying, you know, I don't want to scare, but I want to prepare. And yeah, oh, that's good. You know, I think I'm when you're not prepared, that. it's scarier. Okay, good, good. <laughs> yeah, I think when you're not prepared, it's scarier. And so I think there is. is really something to be said for being really honest. How do you and your husband teach a message of hope, but one that I would call a realistic hope? And what I mean by that is this you've been through some significant health challenges. Gracie has. You are musicians who are now off the road, so a big lifestyle change. Yeah. And yet sometimes I think we find in our Christian faith communities this hope that sounds very ignoring of what's going on, like it's right. not a hope based on what's really going on. And so how do we navigate and come up with a way to communicate hope while also being very honest about what's going on. How have you found hope in those seasons that have been really challenging for you even prior to when all of this came down? You know, there's a couple of things that just really in the last few years, especially since you talked about my health challenges, I had thyroid cancer in 2017. There's a couple of things that I feel like the Lord in his graciousness has really taught me in the last few years. I mean, I've been walking with Jesus since I was a really little girl and more decades than I'm going to admit to you. <laughs> but, you but look good, girl. I, you look I, real yeah, good. <laughs> I've known him for a long time, a long, several decades. Um, but it's funny how the older I get, the deeper I feel like I'm getting to know him. And the, the more simple I feel like we complicate. Um, our relationship with God, we bring religion into it. We make all these rules that he, he actually, Jesus came to break the law, to break the rules, right? To say, this is actually what you need. Faith, my grace is enough for you. It's sufficient in your weakness. And when you begin to actually read those scriptures and realize that it wasn't just some guy spouting off some good ideas, but that it's truth that's unchanging and unshakable. So when you can begin to say to yourself, even when I don't feel it, it's true. Even when I don't believe it, that doesn't actually change the truth or the validity of God's word. It only changes the power of it in my own life. Like I have the choice of whether or not those words are going to have power in my life. It's not something I got to pray for more. It's a choice I make. You either take God at his word or you don't. And so I don't mean to oversimplify it or to Jesus juke it, right? right. <laughs> I really don't like it when people over religious everything, right? Where they kind of like tie Jesus up in a nice, neat little package with a bow on it. Nah, life sucks. Sorry if you have to edit life's, that word out. No, life's messy. It's, it's life messy. is messy. It's hard. Um, it's not one size fits all for everybody. It's a different process, but it is one God that fits all right and it's a god-shaped hole in every single one of us and so for me it's not about 
it's taking away all of the like nice and neat things. It doesn't mean life's going to be perfect. It doesn't. And it doesn't even mean that it's going to feel good because half the time it doesn't feel good, but it does still doesn't change the power that God's word has in our lives. And for me, it's really about realizing, okay, he, number one, all of the things that he says for me are true. His promises, I read the word of God out loud. And um, I don't know if that's just such a, a practical kind of simple thing to say. I think it's really important. I literally have my Bible sitting right next to yeah, me. I feel yeah. like in this season, we have nowhere to go physically or emotionally or there's nowhere to run except for the word right and um, though i love the bible app and i use it regularly for me there's something about holding like yeah. the text in my hand that yep. makes it feel tangible and real and then there's something about reading it out loud so what i do is literally you might feel funny doing it at first especially if you're all by yourself um but there the bible actually says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so that's something to see the words. It's another thing to read it out loud and to hear it. And I also believe that the enemy that the Bible says roams around, right? Like a, like a lion seeking whom he may devour. He can't read my thoughts. I don't think he can, but he hears what I say. And so when you read that out loud, the, the, the enemy cannot defeat the word of God. There's such power in audibly hearing the word. So that's something that I do. And then remembering guys, you have to acknowledge the facts, right? The facts are the facts. So saying, okay, I'm going to just like say that Jesus is this and everything's going to be okay. That doesn't make the facts of what's happening in the natural go away. Right. Facts are facts. We acknowledge the facts. But at the same time, those facts are in the natural. Sorry, my doorbell's been off. Those facts are in the natural, but we're actually a supernatural people. Right, right. And when you remember like, okay, these facts are in the natural and we acknowledge them. We prepare for them. Uh, we use wisdom for them. But then we also remind our soul that we're a supernatural people. So even when we look at the facts, God's grace is enough. Even when the facts don't change in the supernatural, we're fighting from victory, not for victory. Oh, I love and I think that. Those, those are things that we just have to remind ourselves on the regular, right? right. Daily, sometimes hourly. <laughs> uh, yeah, sometimes minute by minute, as you are discovering yes. in the homeschool <laughs> lifestyle now. I, I love yes. what you're saying about having the word of God close because I even love, I have several of my Bibles still have that paper that you don't have in any other kind of book, you know, whether yes. you call it onion skin or whatever, but that thinner paper, it's yes. just this change when you open that. And God wired us. We know now yes. from psychological studies, from neurological studies that what you read and hear at the same time, you retain better, it goes yes. deeper. So I love that advice to really consider reading it out loud from that paper copy, I do think yeah. that is a really beautiful, beautiful thing. So you are newly entered into the homeschool lifestyle. Welcome, my friend. Uh... <laughs> Thank you. Um, I wish it had been an easier on ramp for you. <laughs> oh my gosh! I, I I said whenever the time that we get to go back and social distancing is no longer a thing, I'm gonna straight up cuddle my kids' teachers. <laughs> Like, come in for a long hug. This is going to be a long embrace. Teachers are the heroes of society. And I'm sorry that I've only ever given you coffee gift cards for teacher appreciation. I'm giving you real gifts, people. We are coming in hot with some serious gift baskets now. Yeah. <laughs> I know it is. And I, you know, we've homeschooled for a long time and I've worked full time. So we've had sort of this dance that we've figured out, but I can only, I remember back years ago when we first started homeschooling and those, and that was a choice we made and I had time to prepare to do it. And I was, I cannot imagine being dropped into it. Just yeah. kaboom, kaboom. You know, I, people yeah. have said to me before about the eight kids are like, how on earth do you have eight kids? I'm like, well, we did it one at a time until the last two, you know, it's not like I had eight all at once. I feel like for women who are just starting this process and the guys too, it's like Boom, all of a sudden. I mean, it's a much more intense okay, thing. Okay, and talk about real life. I'm carrying you with me for just a second. Do it. We have a very special um, thing we have to do with the dog groomer because we can't come in contact. And the dog groomer just showed up. And I'm so sorry. 
Oh my gosh. So You're fine. No, I love real so life. This is what it I'm is so right sorry. now, Natalie. This is I'm it. I'm so sorry. Let me get the dog. I have to just sit him on the porch, right? And you have to get him. Okay. Just one second. And just trim him. I'm so sorry. Oh my gosh. You're so good, Just honey. trim him. Not a lot. He's a little bit long. And especially right here. We don't want him looking like a squirrel, but just like trim him <laughs> up a little bit. Not too much. But, but yeah. And still trim it, but just keep that teddy bear look and perfect i'll get him oh my gosh okay <laughs> everybody my girls i'm on an interview but take the doggy to the porch you have to sit him on the porch okay <laughs> <laughs> we did it Woo, we got it i love it i love it <laughs> oh hallelujah praise the lord real life this okay, is amazing so I love sorry. it. No, it's fantastic. Because <laughs> that's the life we're all living right now, Natalie. That's it. It is that Literally. collision of real life and all the things. I'm just grateful that the dog groomer still came. Yeah, I know, I'm like, exactly. I'm grateful. I've done my research. It says that dogs can't carry it. So I'm like, okay, I'm grateful. She's wearing her gloves and her mask. And we're everyone's all good. taking this seriously. So I, And for that, I'm like, I thank you, dog groomer. Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> we you. are figuring it out. And you know, this brings up a really interesting point. I mean... I, look, having routine, having things expected in a certain way has its own beauty. It has its own margin that it gives us for other things we yeah. like to do in our lives. But I love in these moments, I, and I'm not trying to be Pollyanna, but I think one of the silver <laughs> linings is we become more innovative, more creative. Yes. I see things come out of this season that become really powerful moving forward. And you've got a new song that is uh, part of this experience you've been having from different health struggles to our current season now that's going to speak exactly into our today. Mm -hmm. Tell me the genesis of that piece of work and your passion for getting it out right now. Yeah, you know, it's funny because um, it was actually written a, quite a while ago and I recorded it. It's the first song I've recorded for my new record. And I haven't made a record in five years. That's the longest I've ever gone. Um, I'm not a quick creative anyway. I marvel at those people who like turn music out every year. I've yeah, never been like yeah. that. Typically, my process is that I have to, you know, um, live, fail, fall down. Yeah. God picks me up, <laughs> teaches me something, and then I write about it. Um, I'm usually kind of on that every two years. I'll put something out. And at the two year mark for me, this last time is when I got cancer. And as I, I'm, I'm, if people follow me again on social media, I was pretty open about that. Um, you know, they, they, they knew they were going to get the cancer out, but I didn't know I would be able to sing. Um, my, the right where my cancerous tumor was, it was sitting against my vocal nerve. So they kind of prepared me like, Hey, we're going to get the cancer out. Um, you may not be able to sing again. And if you can, you won't have the same power or the same range. So um, obviously my voice came back truthfully. Um, it's like they gave me a tune up while they're in there. My voice yeah. came back stronger than before, um, which was such a gift and the kindness of God. But as a result of that, um, well-meaning, beautiful, sweet people all had a word from God for me. And that was... You're going to sing the songs of your life. You're going to write the songs of your life. You're going to do what you've never done before. God's going to take you to a whole nother level, right? And I can't explain it to you, but that was paralyzing to me. Mm. Um, the expectation. I think it was yeah. because the expect, I literally was like, what do the songs of my life even sound like? Yeah, yeah. What like, is that? Yeah. How do I write that? What if these are just okay? What yeah. if they're not the songs of my life? Yeah. So it paralyzed me for a good 18 months. Like I would look at a blank page and nothing. It was like flatline. Um, and this group of incredible worship songwriters, Andrew Ber Bergthold from We the Kingdom, um, Benji Cower, Ryan Ellis, just some really incredible um, guys that write songs for the church. They were on a writing retreat in the mountains of Colorado. They kind of started this idea and they texted it to me and said, hey, we just really feel like maybe this idea is for you. How does this hit you? What do you think? And I started listening to the very, they kind of did a quick little demo of it for me to hear. And I heard those first words of the first verse. Let every lie be silenced and all depression cease. Let every dark assignment bow down at Jesus' feet. And I can't explain it to you, but some I literally choke up just thinking about it, something broke open in me. It was like a return to something that I've always known but had forgotten. Mm. And for me, I think it was that 
not trying to be clever, not trying to be cool, just plainly stating the powerful, simple truth of who Jesus is and what his name does and the power of his presence. And I ended up writing the chorus and writing the bridge. It's the strangest songwriting session I've ever had. I was never in the same room with those guys. And yet it ended up being the thing that God used to break through for me. Um, it's the first song we wrote. And that's why I went to my record company and I, and I said, guys, please honor this. I don't care if you even like the song. This has to be the first song because it's the foundation of everything that God has been doing through this season of my life. Life is messy. Life is hard. His presence is real. I yeah. mean, that's basically as simple as I can say it. Again, we're not fighting in the natural, but in the supernatural, he's armed us with a weapon that is more powerful to fight everything we face, worry, uncertainty, um, depression, anxiety. And again, it's a daily thing for me. I struggle with fear and anxiety. I really do. And sometimes I go through seasons of struggling with it a little more than others. But every day I realize, okay, the presence of God through his word, the presence of God through the music that we hear on Christian radio, the presence of God through things that we can teaching, that we can fill our hearts and our lives with, this is the greatest weapon we have. And his presence is not a good idea. It's not something that some of us just have this passive knowledge in our head. Yeah, he said he'd never leave us or forsake us. But when you can like change that to an active understanding, it activates something in your life that empowers you in the middle of the storm. It doesn't mean it's going to stop the storm, but it empowers you in the storm. Um, so I feel like the timing of God, I had no idea yeah, that yeah. this was going to be happening, that he did, you yeah, know, he yeah. did. And I feel like, and I, I pray and believe it, it helps a lot of people arm themselves with that great weapon of his presence. That's fantastic. The song is called My Weapon, correct? Yes, my okay, weapon. <laughs> my weapon. And I'll make sure that Rebecca puts it in our show notes for listeners of the oh, podcast so they you. can find it. Hey, guys, go find this song. Go share it. Just as Natalie has been telling us to make sure we're speaking the word of God aloud in our homes, let's be let's be playing the soundtrack of our lives yes. right now. This is yes. really important, the music we put to what's going on yes. right now. So make yes. sure that you get hold of this song, My Weapon, with the beautiful Natalie thank Grant. You. Natalie, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for having me. Of Such course. a joy to speak with you. Oh, great to see you. And <laughs> thanks for all you're doing. You hang in there on thank the homeschool you. journey, girl. <laughs> you, you hang in there with your kids. Stay healthy and sane. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Well, Bless great you. to see you. Thanks so much. Uh, you too. Bye. Bye. <laughs>